Welcome today. No, not everyone's uh, heard of Kirill Pice, and I'm really excited to have him along. I read his book, The One Thing, and, and it made some significant changes to how I thought about uh, the process of looking at my business. And so it was great to be able to get him on today to talk about uh, what he's found as the, the one thing to win at the game of business. So um, I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, Creel Price. Thanks, Arnold. Good to um, be here. It's a pleasure. Uh, Creel, many people have probably not heard about you. I hadn't heard about you until um, actually I read your book and a couple of other things sparked my interest. Um, you grew your business basically under the radar and it went from uh, 500, sorry, $5,000 in capital and then within a decade you sold it for over $100 million. Um, and of course, no one's been Australian, you, you kind of slipped under the radar. So can you tell us a bit about yourself and how you grew your business? Yeah, well, I suppose a, a large part of the under the radar was, was one of two things. Was First of all, Trevor, my business partner and myself, we were, we're the type of people that don't like to be um, you know, the Richard Branson on every front of every magazine. Um, and secondly, our business was really a behind the scenes business where we did a lot of um, outsourcing in the financial services area where we made our clients the heroes for instance you know our large you know we worked for I think 12 out of the top 20 financial institutions in the country well they wanted to be the heroes with their customers they didn't um, necessarily want the customers to know that we were handling all of their business for them. Okay and um, so you ended up with so you just started with you and your business partner how many people did you get to after that in the process I mean you know, we, well we didn't we were actually uh, a lot of people say, you know, how did you manage to pull off such a huge amount of growth without ever having um, external investment into the business? And it, and it was a pretty phenomenon, really. Most businesses get to a certain scale and need to bring in investment to to ramp up their, you know, either their staff or their um, or their offices or their production facilities or whatever it might be. Um, we we managed to, to only do organic growth. Um, however, the real story behind that is um, it's not for want of trying. We we tried to. Um, to get investment a number of times during our uh, our business journey, particularly in the, probably the first five years, but we were never able to arrive at the right terms that we th thought were fair and the market thought was fair, so we just kept going on our own until we got to a stage where the business was really self-funding its own growth, which is really a great position that any, any business wants to get into because really shareholders can cause a whole heap of uh, heap of drama. So by the time we sold the business, we, we you know, Trevor and I had 40% of the shares each. We did get a a small shareholder, and we had a management team where we we um, we gave shares to to allow them to sh share in the um, in the upside, just so um, potentially I could retire before we um, we floated the business. Okay. Um. So since you've retired effectively, or since selling your business, I don't know whether you've actually retired. Have you? Well, I was hoping to retire. That was the. Um, <laughs> Succession attempts that I think many of the businesses listening might might be going through or need to go through is probably one of the hardest things you ever do in business. In fact, we had five succession attempts in our business, or um, really four failed succession attempts. And on the fifth attempt, I said I was going to retire and I wasn't coming back to the business. Just so you didn't have that whole founding entrepreneur comes back and saves the day mentality. People really got the message when I started to use the word retire that I wasn't coming back. So I think that was quite effective from that point of view. But at the age of 35, I think there's a lot of people say, well, you know, you can't spend the next 60 years of your life retired. So I, I think I'm probably one of the busiest retirees out there if, if I am retired. Yes, well, then it's always the question of you retire and then no one else has. <laughs> exactly. I was, I was playing golf with um, my 70-year-old ex-chairman and his cronies, which was quite a bit of a laugh. Yes, exactly. Um, so since um, since then, you, part of your book um, was looking at the one thing that um, why some some businesses uh, succeed and uh, entrepreneurs succeed and others fail. And to be honest, there's been thousands of business books looking at the same principle and the same idea. And some say it's leadership, marketing, vision, financial savvy, technical brilliance. Uh, sales skills, raising capital, but you found something else. Can you kind of go into that a bit more? Yeah, I think I, I you know, as as you know, whilst we weren't a high-profile success story, I, I guess a lot of entrepreneurs and and people that were, um, you know, would recruit me to speak in front of their staff or their um, their clients, and I'd 
I'd sort of share with them our rags to riches story, if you will, and a lot of people at the end of the seminar would come up and say, you know, but you know, thanks for all that, but what was the one thing that, you know, helped you be the you know, one of the fastest growing businesses in Australia? Or what was the, the one thing that enabled you to build such a, you know, a thousand person strong business without any external capital? And you keep hearing this message and think, you know, it's such a ridiculous motion, why would they want one thing? There isn't one thing. And then after the, the twenty eighth time you hear this, you think, you know what, there really is one thing more than anything else. And it, it is your ability to to make decisions, because if you trace any business journey back, it's it's the it's the good decisions that were made, or the, the indecision, or the the decisions that they should have made and didn't, that um, that really make up whether a business is going to be successful or not. And the other thing that I have come across with entrepreneurs, it's it's really overwhelming um, as an entrepreneur. There's so many different things you need to be successful at or good at um, that. You, you really don't invest in your own training because you think, you know, what's the point? There's just too many things. I'm just going to keep plodding along doing what I'm doing. Otherwise, I'm going to get overwhelmed. But when, when you show entrepreneurs the light and saying, look, sure, you can be good at all of those things, but if you focus on this one thing more than any other, you will be successful. I think it gives them a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel that, wow, it's, it, they, can, they can really grasp this one thing. Yes, one of the things that I um, pulled out from the book was, you know, making faster, better informed decisions without the angst, um, which I think was one of the things that comes up at the f in the first parts of the book. Um, so uh, you're actually s saying it, but you're going to, if you follow your system, will you make the <laughs> good decisions all the time? Oh, absolutely not. And that's half the, the, the battle in um, training business owners and entrepreneurs is there is no such thing as a perfect decision. In fact, we have a little methodology that you, you should be splitting your decisions down into minor, uh, major and mega decisions. You know, minor decisions, you really only need to be right 25% of the time. Um, major decisions, maybe you want to be right at least 50% of the time, and, and those mega life-changing decisions, you know, if you've got them right 75% of the time, you're doing really, really well. So it's really... You know, we talk about playing the game of business, and and the odds that you're playing is that you know some of those decisions are going to work, some of them aren't going to work, but it's not a reason not to to be a prolific decision maker. Okay, what's um what's the difference between uh, good decisions and bad decisions? Well, there's, there's, there's two answers to that, I suppose. There's good decisions at the time of making a decision. Okay, so based on all of the information you had at the time you made a certain decision that can still be a great decision even if it didn't, doesn't turn out very well because you made you know, the right decision. There's the other type of decision which is a really hopeless decision that you know, based on the information you had, you really shouldn't have made that decision at all. So what we, we get entrepreneurs to do is, is create what we call a decision bank where they log their, particularly their major and mega decisions in um, and we've got a little electronic way of um, an application that they can do this. And they, for instance, if they were going to hire a general manager, they'll say, "Okay, I'm going to make a decision to hire a general manager for $100,000 by the end of June." And they type that that decision is made. And then we ask them the million-dollar question, which is, "How will you know if this decision is successful?" And they'll say, "Oh, wow, hadn't thought about that. Well, this decision is successful if." Our business turns over an extra half a million dollars in year 2014. We'll go, okay, great. When will you know if this decision is successful? And they'll say, well, by Christmas 2014. So our application puts that into their calendar, and then when Christmas rolls around 2014, it says, you know, you made a decision to hire a general manager for $100,000 back in um, March 2013. You said a, a, um, it would have been a good decision if, they, if your business turned over $500,000 more. What happened? And, and by reviewing that decision, you can really start to get the gist of whether that was a good decision with the information you had at the time or not. Okay. Um, isn't just uh, decision-making skills down to experience? Yes and no. I mean, there's a lot of... We come under a lot of fire, I, I suppose, from people that says, you know, entrepreneurship can't be trained. Um, well, from, my belief is that if it can't be trained, well, why is it that only 80% of businesses survive more than five years? Um, you know, it's a pretty dismal statistic that um, that 80% of businesses go bust. Um, so therefore, there must be a way to help these people that are um, that are failing to do better. And in my belief, the way to do that is obviously train them in decisionship. Hmm. And then the next thing we get thrown at us is, well, isn't making decisions just all about gut feel? And the answer to that is, yeah, if I'm 62 years of age and I'm Richard Branson, I've had a wealth of 
entrepreneurial experience, I can start to use my gut feel and make decisions, you know, 80% of the time correct. But if I'm just starting out in business or I've got a history of making really bad decisions, that experience doesn't really count for a lot. So what we're trying to do is, is using a methodology to build up the decision-making experience and making it quite overt rather than just saying, oh, yeah, that was experience. Let's make sure that if we do make a decision that turns into an absolute failure, we actually learn from it. And next time we make a similar decision, um, we'll factor those, those sort of things in. For instance, an example might be if, you, if you're someone who often employs um, staff that, um, that sort of come up in front of you, it's someone's cousin's brother's uncle, and says, oh, you know, they're really good at um, marketing. You should interview them. You interview them. You think, oh, yeah, we should make a position available. And this always turns into disaster where you need to make part of your hindsight that, you know, whenever you've got a position available or someone um, that comes up as a possible employer, you make sure you interview at least two other people. Yes, yes. Well, the other part of it I liked is all, as part of that was also having a, an option to any decision. So sometimes decisions are looked at on their own um, without an alternative view to what could be done. Exactly. So, and then we, and we call that making decisions in binary. So our minds ideally work in binary, which is you know either this decision or another decision. So having two choices means that you can actually physically ask the brain, should I do this or this? You'll find that you'll make a lot better decisions simply by going through a small process like that. And, and you know, I certainly don't disregard experience, but what we're trying to do is fast track your ability to build up that decision making experience in a very overt way that it'll help your future decision making. Yes, and I suppose everyone else's um, experience comes from all the past actions that they've done before. So there could be you know, an aversion to pain of, of a particular item that's preventing them from moving forward into the area that they need to, whether it be confidence or you know they've they've had a bad experience with an employee before, or um, they just um, don't know how to sell or <laughs> any particular thing. I suppose all those factors come into it as well. Oh sure, I mean I'm, I'm only a, a novice when it comes to the workings of the brain, probably. In fact, there's very few people around the world, I think, that could claim themselves an expert. But it does work in pretty weird and wonderful ways. So the reason why we have developed quite a comprehensive decision-making process is because of the way that the brain functions. And if you can actually start to um, to realise why you're making certain decisions in certain ways, um, you, you're going to be a much better decision-maker. And taking it from the subjective to the objective. Exactly. <laughs> but not ruling out that emotional. So, you know, we spend a huge amount of time in our training programs helping people around the emotional side of, of making decisions as much as the rational side. Okay. Um, one of the things that we see is um, different, um, there's different types of people, and probably everyone's seen it in their, in their business. Um, you know, something I got from your book is just the decision, ship pro decision profiles. Can you just go into a bit more about how that works and what type of, how that affects people's decision making skills? Sure, we've sort of really identified that, you know, this, this methodology that I've developed I call decisionship, which as you mentioned before is your ability to make faster, better informed decisions without the angst. Okay, that's really the crux of what we're trying to achieve. So if you then break that down, it's really made up of three things. The speed you make decisions, the amount of information you have when you're making decisions, and then the amount of angst or anxiousness you feel when you're making decisions. So the, the six decision-making profiles that we've developed um, really use a combination of all of these three traits. So for instance, a procrastinator is someone who obviously doesn't make decisions fast enough. You know, they're that traditional entrepreneurial business owner that you know, gets to the precipice and they feel like a rabbit caught in the headlights and they think, oh, no, I'm just going to wait. And they're waiting and waiting and waiting and before long their competitors or the market or their customers move on um, and their business is, is, is the worse off for it. Well, on the opposite side of that scale is the, uh, the bull at a gate, someone who you know, makes decisions very, very fast and a lot of entrepreneurs are in that, um, that category and I, I would include myself in that, um, that you just make decisions way too fast without really thinking about the, um, what, what you're doing and then you, you have a tendency to change your mind the very next day. Well, unfortunately, what happens is your employees tend to get a little bit left behind 
um, and then they start to not believe what you're um, you're going to decide because they think, well, you're probably going to change his mind anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, well, and, and most of us most of us have probably worked for someone that's either a procrastinator, maybe in a big corporate, or a bull to gate, maybe in a smaller business, and, and both of them are very frustrating. Yes, I mean, you could, can be a combination of all these, couldn't you? I mean. Absolutely. Yeah, there's no, you know, some people are very much at the extremes of one of these uh, traits, but most people have elements of, of, of some of them um, that make up their profile, and, and that profile really does change depending on the type of decision they're making, um, and it depends on which stage they are in the business journey um, and how much entrepreneurial experience they have. Um, and that's why we're, we're a big proponent of, of really checking in with your decisionship profile, and we've got a diagnostic that helps understand what your score is for each of these things, um, probably each quarter, so you can start to learn and realise where you are at the time. Yeah, I, mean, I, w I went through the, the, the process on, on the website and found that I was you know, procrastinating a bull of the gate and a data junkie. I mean, being an accountant, I can understand being the, the data junkie and is probably looking at different roles that I perform in the business. So we're doing you know, the complex um, expert witness reports for court and which I'm probably more of a procrastinator and a, a data junkie about which is in some ways necessary for that but combine that with you know the bullet and the ga bullet the gate uh, decision making in terms of other parts of our business so the marketing etc yeah and I think sometimes professions really start to take on a trait in their profession, but also in their business. So, for instance, in the, in the legal profession, um, you know, we pay lawyers really to be worry warts. We want them to be the ones that are losing sleep if we're not, um, you know, if, if we've got exposure in some way with a contract or, or something. But lawyers, you know, they should be doing that in their profession. But in their business, they shouldn't be taking the same methodology um, in how they're trying to grow their business. As an example, I mean, I suppose that gets down to that issue of, for a lot of professional firms, is breaking up their business into what well, someone called it as minders, grinders and finders. Um, sure, and having, I've not heard that, that's great. <laughs> but having different people to um, do different tasks and not expecting someone is going to actually be someone who does the work, manages the people and finds the work because um, the decision making and the, the brain space needed to do all those things is quite often quite different. Absolutely, and you're seeing some professional service firms, in both in the accounting and the legal profession, starting to take on CEOs, as an example, from a different profession uh, completely to run the business. So then there's more complementary skills rather than um, really employing people that are the same as ourselves. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things I got from the book was the issue of frictions, and I, I know she had a, a diagnostic for determining um, the frictions, and I found that just a fantastic thing. I'll probably, you kind of have it in your mind anyway about you know, what's holding back in terms of making decisions or I suppose this is a combination of experience and everything else. Can you go into a bit about the frictions side of the, the process? Yeah, well, I, this, this was probably the, the first bit of entrepreneurial IPI development. You know, it would be close to 10 years ago now. And it, it came about, I mentioned succession plans before about how we had quite a few failed attempts. Well, our, my very first succession attempt, I, um, we handed over to a general manager and he found I was hanging around the office a little bit too long. So he said, you know, Creel, you know, the, the way we do business, how we've become such a fast growing business is, is you know, there's a really unique way of doing it. Why don't you go home and spend time trying to put down the science of how that happens? And I, I, was, I was quite excited, so I went home. But obviously, in hindsight, I realised he was trying to get me out of the office. But um, on the first day, at sitting at home and, and trying to, 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 to digest what is it that made our business such a fast-growing business when other, other businesses tended to, um, to plateau, if you like, I realised that we, we spent a huge amount of time trying to help our stakeholders, whether that was employees or clients or suppliers or our, or our investors, which is really us at the time, trying to actually reduce frictions. What, so we could actually remove the barriers to, to acceleration, if you like. And, and then I, I guess I remembered some of those Year 9 science lessons um, where we talked about Newton's uh, laws of gravity. So I did a little bit more research and, and realised that actually Newton's laws of gravity and motion were actually so relevant to, uh, to the business world. And I developed from that the perpetual growth principles, four principles that if you harness these, your business is going to accelerate a lot faster. Well, well, one of these, and probably one of the most powerful, is 
the need to constantly look at trying to reduce frictions in your business, which are created, if you like, of, of a shortage of time, money, knowledge or momentum. Okay, so just to give you an example, a, a shortage of, um, of knowledge and time would be cause a friction we call lack of focus. Too many people spend way too much time on things like accounting that they don't have enough knowledge about. So we would recommend how do you outsource that to someone who's an expert rather than trying to do it yourself. A shortage of money is obviously a shortage of, say, capital um, to grow the business or income to pay yourself an adequate wage. A so, shortage of momentum might be, you know, lack of sales. Okay. So, it's, I mean, I suppose it's, it's a way of recognising quite quickly um, where your uh, weaknesses are and removing those yeah, weaknesses. I think, yeah. yeah, weaknesses and things. You know, we want on, the entrepreneurial journey, if you like, to be a fun ride. The reason why it's not a fun ride is because of frictions, but also the reason why there's a business opportunity to capitalise on is because other people find, find some issues uh, with trying to pull off what you're trying to pull off. So if you can actually create a, 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 a more frictionless platform that gets you ahead faster, you're going to succeed when your competitors don't. So I think it makes also makes the business journey a lot better. For instance, you know, as an example, one of the frictions, a lack of time is a lack of support. So therefore, if you can come up with a way to be able to get more support, whether that's bringing on a business partner or bringing on a staff member that's going to help you out, you're going to enjoy the uh, the road of business a lot more. Okay. And you, you, you've taken all this and put it into a kind of a decision-making methodology um, in your book. I mean, one part of it was the entrepreneurial eye and looking through it in terms of, of different lenses, um, which in the first instance when I started to read it, I, I got a bit confused, but <laughs> it made sense towards the end. Um, can, can you explain about just the, the different lenses and what that process um, we haven't got a lot of time to go through this. I mean, your book covers it quite um, extensively. But can you go through a bit about that issue of the entrepreneurial eye? Yeah, well, sure. It's, it's, it's about how do we develop this skill of decisionship into people so they might be able to look at issues or opportunities like a, you know, a Bill Gates or a Warren Buffett or a Richard Branson might look at something. So we've digested that down into to three pretty simple steps. You need to define the issue or opportunity into an affirmative question. You then need to um, assess the various options to you using your insight, foresight and hindsight. And lastly, you need to make a decision. A lot of people do all of those first two steps and then they still don't actually make a decision. So We've developed a, a pretty comprehensive methodology for you to, to do that. Um, you talked before about the lenses. If I, I might give you a little bit of an example. So to develop uh, foresight when you're assessing decisions, uh, we've developed six lenses of foresight, three that work on you as an individual and three that work on your business. For instance, as an individual, you need to look at the lenses of, of passion, uh, proficiency, which is essentially your skills, um, and philosophy, which is essentially your um, your values. And then on the, the business side, you need to look at the traditional things, your business model, your business plan, and your business progress. So if you look at those six lenses, and it really can take less than two minutes once you've done a little bit of pre-work, you'll make decisions with a lot more foresight. Now, I just went through the process, you know, just quickly with a couple of decisions, and it, it really made things quite clear in terms of uh, how to approach any decision and whether it's um, it had a kind of a major impact quite quickly. Um, just in terms of um, you met Richard Branson, Sir Richard Branson, and was that a was that a result of your decision making or was that a, a fluke? Well, a little bit of both, probably. I. Um I made a decision in retiring from business that I was going to um, to hopefully make a positive impact on the world through social enterprise. So I've been involved in, in quite a lot of social enterprises, including uh, one, the Club Kidpreneur Foundation that I've set up myself. Um, well, Richard was looking at new ways of, I guess, using philanthropy to, to, to make the world a better place, and he invited uh, 20 social entrepreneurs from around the world to his island. The fluke part of it was that um, was I wasn't one of those 20 entrepreneurs that he invited, but one of my co-founders in, um, in a, a business called One Water in the UK was having a baby that week. So 
so he couldn't go and I, I went in his place. So, uh, so the, I guess there's some decision making involved in, in making it to his, uh, his island. In, in some ways it was also a little bit of luck. Okay. So where did you take it from there? Was it just, I mean, I understand you've been working in Africa and places like that as well? Yeah, well, I think we, we had a, a meeting of the minds. Richard believes, like I do, that uh, that entrepreneurship is the way that we're going to um, get particularly uh, impoverished nations out of that, the rut. It's not about giving them lots more aid or lots more charity or even setting up micro-business. It's about setting up entrepreneurial businesses that will go on to create innovation and employ people in the future. Well, to help his endeavour in that, he's, um, he's created the Branson Centre for Entrepreneurship and it started in South Africa. And... Um, he realised pretty early on that training entrepreneurs is not an easy thing, and particularly in a, in a, in a culture where the education system uh, for these youths that had come through wasn't, wasn't, very, um, wasn't very good. So he asked if, whether my decisionship methodology might be, uh, might be relevant, and I sort of jumped at the chance. And, and for the last three years, I've, I've been doing a considerable amount of work for the Branson Centre for Entrepreneurship, including um, some of their uh, curriculum is now run by decisionship, and I do a boot camp for them, uh, for them each year. I mean, I can I can see why that's. I mean, if you have to teach someone about, many people have they said, well, what do you need to know about running a business? And you know, if you're an accountant, you'd start talking about, okay, you need to do all these accounting things for running a business. And um, the 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 uh, the marketers would have another spin on it, and it would be kind of there's a lot of knowledge there that kind of we learned as part of our professions and business life that. It would be very hard to put down into one quick go to say this is what you need to know. Mm. And across different industries as well. Every industry is different. Every size of business is different. Every experience of every entrepreneur is different. So you know, by making decisionship, I guess, the one thing, it, it's, it's an all-encompassing thing. You know, We train people that have got a $50 million business and we train people that have just started up in South Africa that have come out of a, um, a slum and they've started it with, um, with $50 of their own money. It's, it's the same methodology that uh, works for each of them. Okay. Um, so if we wanted to, to learn more, of course, there's your book. Um, but you've got a couple, you've got some seminars coming up and some, some online programs as well. Um, can you just, I think one of them's called the 2020 uh, program. Is that the 2020 Training Your Entrepreneurial Eye, isn't it? Yeah, well, that's, that's two different programs. So, okay, sorry. Yeah, our, our core program is the um, is the Train Your Entrepreneurial Eye program, which is essentially takes people through the decisionship methodology. But I explain it a little bit like, um, you know, if, you, if you're sick and you go to your doctor and you say, "Doc, I'm, I'm a little bit sick," and the doctor says, "Okay, well, you need to do some more exercise, you need to eat healthy, and you need to work a little bit less so you're not stressed as much." Well. That's not really what we want to hear. We want to hear the doctor say, okay, here's a prescription. You take these pills. In three days' time, you're going to be bouncing around. The Train Your Entrepreneurial Life program is that um, prescription of it's a change of lifestyle. You just need to eat healthy or, or focus on the things, but it's a long-term fix. You're not going to get immediate uplift in, in everything in your business. The, the immediate uplift is, is our program we call the 2020 Challenge. Um, also, it's now a seminar product called The Numbers Game. Essentially, how do you start to focus on a few small things um, that's going you know, to enable you to sell more, make more, achieve more, and stress less? Um, so it's the, it's the pill for entrepreneurs that you can get a very quick injection to get your business back on track. So therefore, you can concentrate on the, um, on, on the, the element, the decisionship element that is going to make the long-term difference. Okay, fantastic. And so the, the, set, the, the numbers game seminar, which I think you're holding in Sydney on the 20th, um, that's... Um, that takes, is it any, what you said, or was it an extension or a, the 2020 challenge in, in a No, it's exactly the, the 2020 challenge is, is an online program that people do over 20 days. Um, and it's a challenge because it's not easy to complete making 20 decisions about these areas in, in 20 days. What we've done is we've taken that same format, the same IP, which has been proven now over, I think we've run five challenges, um, probably, a, probably a thousand entrepreneurs or so have been through the 2020 challenge. So it's a very proven methodology. Um, and we now run that as a seminar format, so people who, who either don't want to do an online program or want to do something a little bit more intensive um, can get those same learnings. And, and, and really what we're focusing on is the, the 12 numbers that made a massive difference in our business to make us one of the fastest growing businesses in Australia. Um, how do we look at those numbers and, 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 and implement those changes in your business? Okay. Well, that sounds fantastic. Um, well, thank you very much, Krill. Um, we'll... Uh 
for your time and coming along today. Uh, and I'm sure if there's uh, questions, I'll be, we can put them to the to everyone at the moment. That sounds great, Lee. Thanks for having me, Arnold.